Aloha. Welcome. This is the show, The State of the State of Hawaii. I'm your host, Stephanie Stoltalton. And as you know, we are in the campaign season. So this show features electoral candidates to talk about their campaign experiences and messages and uh, goals. Our guest today is Vicki Cayetano. She is uh, a former first lady, as you know, and a Hawaii businesswoman uh, as um, for many, many decades, I think, if it's okay to say that, Vicki. <laughs> Her, she's running for the first time and for an executive position um, of public service, that is governor. So welcome, uh, Vicki, to Think Tech Hawaii and this show. Well, thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. And thank you for having me on today. I appreciate it. Thank you. So glad you can make it because uh, I know you're busy. So Vicki, I, I know you're no stranger to politics, but as, as we've said, you were former first lady, but you yourself have not been a career politician. So how is your transition to politician going? Well, you know, uh, you're correct. I've not been a lifetime politician. I uh, started a business 34 years ago with 25, and uh, 25 employees. I'm an entrepreneur businesswoman, and I grew that business over that period of time with a great team uh, to pre-pandemic, six locations, three islands, 1,200 employees. So at the heart of what I like to do is create jobs, create opportunities, and take something that is nothing and make it into something that is great. That is really what entrepreneurs and business people like to do. Uh, but I got into this because I, I think like many people in this state, uh, I believe that our state is at the most critical juncture that it's ever been. Um, it's no secret that five years straight in a row, uh, we have lost population base. And the saddest part is that the people who are leaving are our young people, our working people. And, you know, I share with you and your viewers today, if the young people, the future of our state, if they are leaving Hawaii, what kind of future do you think we can even hope to have? It's pretty you know, somber. That is, is a critical issue, and I'm sure um, that you have a long list of them, but that is a very critical one, and it sounds like it's a priority uh, of, your, of your campaign and of your goals as governor. Um, you know, on, on the website, on your website, which we're running, um, streaming across the screen, folks, so if you can take a look at that, um, you call for the new normal in governing. So with respect to that issue or maybe uh, others, what, what does new normal look like in, um, in managing pressing Hawaii issues? Can you talk a little bit about normal, what normal, new, new normal <laughs> looks like in relating to uh, either that issue or the economy or housing for all tourism, education, healthcare, and uh, uh, all of the others that I know you're, you're standing for? So that's a great question. When I say new normal, what I mean is, I like normal because I believe that people need stability and they need to an extent predictability. Too often we react rather than be proactive about looking at our issues. Uh, but when I say new, it's to say that there's a new way, a new paradigm of how we look at things and how we do things in government. Uh, I want to bring to the governorship a new normal of governing, meaning transparency, accountability, and urgency. You know, time is our most precious resource. If you lose money, you have an opportunity to make it back. With time, you don't have that opportunity. And I feel like we've lost so many years that we keep talking about affordable housing, we keep talking about homelessness, and yet the problems are, are worse now than they were before. And you know, it's not fair to the people, the public at large. They're the people that government needs to serve, not just the special interest groups. So that's what I mean by a new normal, is understanding who we are to be serving. Two is how we should be doing this. 
with transparency and accountability so we can deliver what we've been promising. And three is with that sense of urgency that we don't seem to have in our government. Mm -hmm. So is that is that what you mean then um, about being proactive instead of reactive. And I, I saw I saw in, in your messaging that perhaps that was a way you were characterizing what, what you see as been a trend in, in the style of governing on the means of leadership. And so by bringing in these other things that, that, that doesn't just mean reacting to the problems as they come down, and certainly they come down fast as they have over the last couple of years. But is, is that what you mean then by the new normal using those features you said being transparent and, um, and, and, and moving away from just reacting to what's on the table. Correct. And, that, and that, you know, I'll give you just one example. Uh, when the legislature appropriated $600 million, $600 million to the Department of Hawaiian Homelands, I certainly applaud that. And it's, it's overdue. So that's great. But let me just say this. If we don't look at the underlying systemic problems of what takes so long to build this housing, we're not going to be able to spend that kind of money. So we need to dig deep down and address those problems and fix them, even as we commit resources, financial resources uh, to them. Because like so many problems, it's not solved by just put throwing money at it. There are many other issues that we need to address. And I want to bring the mindset that I've, I've had for 34 years of executive leadership of, you know, balancing uh, payroll and having those responsibilities over employees to take care of them uh, to this position. And that is being able to have that foresight to see things and not just wait till it's staring right at you and then having to react. That's too late. Well, do you see that as a, a strength out of a non-political background, rather uh, um, having a non-political background in business, you bring um, those, that kind of a strength to your promise of governing in a new, in a new fashion. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Okay. But when you say, when you, you bring up this process of being transparent in um as you've described it, how do you make, how do you instantiate that process in the office and in, in the governing uh, process? So how does that, how are you going to make that happen? What would you do? Tell us a little bit more about how that would actually get started and work. Well, I think the first thing is understanding what it takes to produce a successful outcome, right? So being governor, I think one of the most important roles is to have a, a great cabinet team of pe people surrounding you, both with, with institutional knowledge, but also with new ideas and new thinking, uh, to recognize the important stakeholders uh, and partnerships, such as those with the legislative branch. No governor will be successful without recognizing the importance of collaboration especially with the legislature, you know, in order to uh, come up with the solutions that are needed for the people of Hawaii. And I would reach out to the counties, to the mayors, because leadership is not about, this is your responsibility, the county, and this is state responsibility. You know, the taxpayers don't care about that. They want solutions. And so, like everything in life, if we can work synergistically together, collaborate together, we can produce so much more, you know, in a partnership than working in silos. That, that doesn't do, you know, for me, doesn't uh, produce the kind of outcome that we need desperately now. Well, there was another feature of your proposed uh, leadership style in the office that that I wanted to ask you about to see how it fits into what you've already brought on. And that is the, that humility, having a humble style can make a difference um, for tough problems. So how, how does a humble style fit into that picture of that new normal process of governing? 
So I think it's recognizing who we serve. You know, I, I was always shared before with our employees that the signature on your paycheck is not me as your boss. It is the customer that we serve. Likewise, it's really important for us in the state government and county government to recognize that the taxpayers, the public, those are our customers. That is who we exist to serve. And it is in that spirit that I think we need to kind of shift our mindset on on who walks in through those doors and that we take care of the public because that's our mission is to make our community a better place for our residents. So humility is also about being the first to reach out to people, going to communities, to stakeholders around the table and bringing everyone together so that we can serve our people better. Well, I've been told and others have mentioned that the the legislature and the the other uh, leaders that are in the decision making for the state are can be pretty tough stuff up there. So it can be uh, quite a bit of a challenge and wanted to know how you can bring all of that into that process and what what is your thinking about the way you will enter it and take hold of it get a grip on it how how what what, what kind of nuts and bolts are you looking to see having to do in that role to get started knowing that the pressure's on and that you have to produce. But give us a little insight here into how you're trying to figure that out. So I believe that to affect change in others, we must affect change within ourselves. So to me, it's all about leading by example, uh, not expecting from others what we ourselves cannot do. Uh, Larry Bossidy used to, and I had the great pleasure of speaking with him, and he said to change a culture, you change behavior. The behavior is what will change the culture. So when we want people to reach out to others, then we must reach out to them first. So I would just lead with an example of servant leadership, because that's always been the philosophy I've led with for all my life in my job, that the higher you go, it all it means is the more people you serve and the more people you need to take care of. It's servant leadership. That to me is the pinnacle of what good leadership is about. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, does that sound like a match to that, that? That's a match for the way Hawaii has worked, or will this require quite a bit of transformation in the processes that are already there? I think it's so in alignment with the Aloha spirit mm-hmm. of to people with that in your heart, you know, and no matter our differences of opinion, to be able to conduct ourselves with civility and respect towards one another. And we mustn't be afraid to bring people together who have opposing views of issues. Because when we make the commitment that we will work through all of this, that is when we can start producing the results rather than deferring or delaying the discussion. This is, to me, really important. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, what are the top five issues that you have in mind to take on uh, right away? Um, Sorry, I didn't mean to. (laughs) At the heart of everything, Stephanie, it's bringing our young people back. And being able to keep them here by making Hawaii affordable so they can live and thrive here, so they can realize their dreams of being with their families uh, and being able to own a home one day. Um, So at the heart of everything is that. And so what does that entail? It entails affordable housing, cost of living, education, job opportunities, and let's not forget climate change. We need to address these things that are um, staring right at us now already. And while Hawaii has made great progress in certain areas, we can always do more 
and do better. So it's not just like one solution. It's really multiple issues that face uh, our state. And they're all interconnected with each other. Native Hawaiian issues. Uh, and let's not forget what it takes to have a thriving community, arts, animal welfare. You know, people don't even talk about that. It's like we should just be satisfied to barely survive. I wouldn't leave a job that I so love, a company that I co founded, if I didn't think that we can do much more. Well, how is your campaign experience going? This is your first campaign. I'm sure you know. Um, much campaigning from having uh, helped out in your family to uh, campaign for, for, um, for public office. But how is it going in this one that is your own? What do you see you're doing there that models um, what, what you're trying to help us understand will be your way of governing in the, in the office? Well, it's interesting. Uh, you know, it's certainly been many years, 20 years since the last campaign has been involved in significantly. And in that time, uh, the world changes a lot. And one of the things I want to do is bring about a new state in our government where we can move uh, and respond quickly to situations to be able to pivot is to me key to being successful. And uh so it's very different. Social media plays a huge role now in campaigns, communications. Issues in some ways are very similar, but there are some new things as well. But I think that what's different now is the speed of which things move. Uh, I really love getting out to the communities, listening to the people um, and hearing straight talk from them on what concerns them. That's the part of campaigning that I really like most. Um, but it's great. I, I feel a lot of energy from our supporters, and uh, I'm excited. Well, you know, we have had an influx of federal funding um, into this state, as, as the other states have had, too. How, how do you feel about that, that funding? What does that make you think about? Well, I think it's a great opportunity and one that must not be wasted. And by that, I mean two things. One, we need to put in place uh, accountability so we know where the monies are being spent. Two, we need to be prudent and not use them to invest in projects that will end up costing us or the taxpayers more money in order to maintain them. So we have to be very careful where we're spending this money to make sure that it's uh, prudently done and that the way it's managed uh, is accountable. You know, this is really key. When I heard about those COVID test kits, what was it, almost 23 million uh, that were thrown out because they had already expired? You know, that to me is an example of, of the system failing, right? How in the world is it that we didn't even know and then didn't make use of all these? Uh, test kits that were just thrown down the drain. I was raised with waste is, is the biggest sin. We cannot waste anything. <laughs> so, you know, I'll tell you an interesting story. Growing up, we had nine children. Uh, I was number six. And my father had the system. Every time he opened anything, he would date it. And I used to ask him as a kid, Dad, why do you date the cereal? Ah, I'm glad you asked me that. And he would tell me because number one, I know how quickly it takes for all of you to go through it. Or two, <laughs> you're not eating it. I don't buy it again. So ever since I was a kid, my dad always preached accountability and never be wasteful, mm -hmm. especially when it's other people's money. Oh, that's a, that is certainly a practice I hope we could put in place and, and be able to uh, make the best use of those precious uh, funds that are coming in. I mean, it was, it, it, it really made a difference in what it looked like we could do in this state. But um, uh, we were on the brink at the edge. And of course, our con the economy is still challenging, as, as, as you know, and will address um, and in, in that matter, how, how will you address the economy? What is it that uh, you will look to for resource for how we can pull the economy out of, um, well, it wasn't free fall, but now it's, it's just needing to be um, 
but uh, you know, in, inspired and expanded. So what are you thinking about the, the major issues of the economy and how to address them? You know, as I uh, go into the communities and meet with various stakeholders and people in the communities, I must share with you how encouraged I am uh, that there isn't a, a shortage, a lack of good ideas. Uh, there really isn't. But yeah. biggest challenge has been in the ability to execute, to implement, mm -hmm. to collaborate and bring the right people together. That's what's missing. And I look forward to being able to do that because that's what I've done naturally all 34 years of my career is reaching out to people, knowing uh, how to bring things about together and with a new mindset of creativity to be able to uh, put together expand new businesses and put together new businesses that should be in Hawaii that that aren't. And there's no reason, for example, why can't we expand film and digital media, uh, healthcare? That would not only, if we created a, a niche in healthcare tourism, that would not only benefit us in terms of tourism, but also more importantly, it would elevate the availability and the um, level the caliber of healthcare to our local residents. And especially on uh, the neighbor islands, healthcare is beginning to be a real uh, problem with the shortage of uh, physicians, nurses, and other healthcare personnel. Well, that certainly is a critical a topic. And um, how, do, do you see that tourism healthcare, do you see that luring in international folks as well? Yes. Uh, are you looking to that population? Okay. Uh -huh. Right. From Asia. You yeah. know, there's why people from Japan, uh, Singapore, elsewhere fly over us and go to the West Coast when Hawaii has such a natural affinity for the Asia travel. Well, I, I think that that is uh, very exciting to know about. I think there's a lot of criticism of the healthcare here, certainly because of the, the limited resources we have. I mean, it's really even hard to find a doctor, right? That's open. So that to do something like that, Vicki, um, I mean, that would be a tremendous effort. Where would, where would uh, the funding come? I mean, that would be an expensive uh, uh, idea to, to, in, in, to, to, to try and make happen, wouldn't it? What, so, what sort of thoughts have you had about how to do that? So one of the things we have to realize is part of the problem that we have in keeping our physicians is with the reimbursement uh, situation. Uh, with Medicare in Hawaii pegged to that of Guam, the Medicare reimbursements is one of the lowest in the country. And yet in a state where the cost of living is, is the highest, it is a complicated issue. It has to be worked with at, with the congressional delegation at the federal level to see how we can address that. But one of the things I would share is that when you have people coming from Asia using their monies to pay for health care, it helps to offset uh, a profession that depends heavily on these insurance reimbursements that are becoming sorely inadequate. So you see, it actually will help us when we do that. Mm -hmm. We have find a way to uh, retain and also to attract back some of the uh, healthcare personnel, physicians, nurses that we have lost. Yes, I think that um, I don't know so much about the medical um, education resources here as I do about the dentistry. I know that I was very surprised to find out that UH um, or the state doesn't have a dental school. So, I mean, many people go away to go to school and then there's, um, and then they're gone. And one of the problems with, um, you know, bringing people back home again um, is certainly there has to be enough business here, uh, but there also has to be the education opportunity too. So there, there's some pieces um, that could be picked up there. That That's very interesting. Yeah. All connected together. And, you know, uh, that was over 20 years ago, but as former, for, as a first lady at that time, I fought to have the, funding restored to the Queen's uh, dental school, uh, dental uh, clinic for uh, the people in our community who needed it most. And, and so that's what we need. We need a governor who will collaborate, but also fight for what is right. And it's time for that kind of leadership. 
Uh, it really, there really is that, and that that is an area where there there isn't much available for adults for anything beyond just the most minimal service. Anyway, we could talk about that later once you're governor, and I'll come back and remind you of that. Well, what I wanted to ask you about uh, was in in the position when you're elected, what what outcomes are you determined to to have in place? when you leave after your two terms? I think it's so important to put in place a system, to put in place uh, the kinds of protocol and laws that will create sustainability uh, even after one leaves. That's been my whole life approach to how we do things. It's how I've been able to leave a business knowing it's in good hands because all the systems that were designed and put in place are being followed. It's not just in the mind of one person. And that's what I want to do. So I can leave at this stage in my life. I want to leave a legacy so that the young people who come back say, thank goodness that Vicki Cayetano became our governor and we are able to be here and live and thrive in the Hawaii that we love with our ohana. That's what I want to leave this place, hearing them say that. Oh, yeah, I would bring great joy. I, I'd love to take this time certainly to ask you to say some things that you, you would just like to say uh, to, to the viewers of Think Tech Hawaii for this show. Uh, but before, before we finish up with that, I, I was very pleased you went back to your familial, your, your childhood situation and talked about your wonderfully, a wonderful father. Um, but also I came across an article uh, about your sister the concert pianist at two and a half or something, and that uh, you all went all around the the world, the country, performing uh, with her. So that background um, must make you feel very confident in the in the public presentation uh, part of of this role as governor. How how do you think that? And I I know it went on all through your childhood. You were performing along with your sister. How do you think that has uh, shaped you for being um, in such a public and uh, high leadership role? Well, I think that and Ginny is really the talented one. I, I would yeah, that's she's the one who still performs today. Uh, but for me, I think having the opportunity to travel and meet people globally does give you a little bit of a different mindset that we mustn't be afraid to bring Hawaii to the world, but also to bring others into our arena where we can you know, support one another and make this, make our state the most beautiful state as it already is, but even better uh, in this country and to the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. I'd like you to say, um, as we close here um, in the next minute, what, what your, your campaign statements might be or some things that you would like to say to the viewers about how you will be our governor and how you will make these changes happen and um, how uh, the people will be pleased and having that opportunity to see you function that way. Well, I want to thank you, Stephanie, and all your viewers for having me on. And I would just say that, you know, last week I sent my, I said goodbye to my son and his family who, went, who moved to the mainland because they're not the opportunities here and the cost of living is too high. Mm -hmm. And I would just say that that's my dream is to bring people, young people like you back. And if you are satisfied with the way things are, then, you know, that's one thing. But if you want something better for your family and for Hawaii, I am your candidate because I am so determined. I will put my heart and everything into this to make sure that we have a Hawaii where our young people can thrive and live here and we can keep our ohana together because that's not what's happening right now. So I thank you for the privilege of speaking and having this interview with you. And I hope you'll consider me as your candidate for governor. Thank you very much, Vicki. It's been a pleasure to have this conversation with you. And it's been very clear about how you, you will serve the state of Hawaii in ways that it needs at this time. So I wish you the best of luck and hope that maybe you'll come back again later as we get closer to the final uh, outcome. And uh, then maybe even after you're in, in the position, <laughs> you'd be happy to come back to Think Take yeah. a while. 
<laughs> thank you thank so you. much for taking the time. It's been a pleasure to work with your staff too for this. So thank you so much. Aloha. So it is uh, time to um, close. And I wanna thank all the viewers of this show, the state of the state of Hawaii. And I'm Stephanie Stahl Dalton, your host, and I'll see you in two weeks. Thank you very much for your viewership. Uh, mahalo and aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.